Welcome to Cracking Coconuts, a podcast brought to you by 47 Roots. We aim to provide the alternative view that mainstream media often overlooks. We'll be providing a platform for underrepresented voices in South Asia. For our pilot episode, we'll be talking to a diaspora journalist on the recent developments in Sri Lanka. So let's get started. Recently, Sri Lanka has been voted by Lonely Planet as the number one holiday destination. With the second highest number of abductions, who wouldn't want to visit this exotic nation? To provide some context, Sri Lanka has been wrought with decades of tension and conflict between the two major ethnicities, the Sinhalese and the Tamils. The 25-year civil war has seen the massacre of tens of thousands of Tamils, especially in the last couple of weeks of the war. The transitional government was set in place to implement policies for reconciliation, but now things have taken a huge U-turn. It has been just over a week since President Sirisena appointed former president and alleged war criminal Mahinda Rajapaksa as prime minister in place of Ranil. Security concerns have peaked across the nation, particularly for minorities, activists and journalists who fear refreshed repression and retribution for speaking out over the past few years. Rajapaksa's reign was marked by the genocide of Tamils. He orchestrated the murder of tens of thousands of Tamils and now holds power over them once again. Gotabaya Rajapaksa, a man who tried to justify the bombings of schools and hospitals, is reportedly looking at returning to Defence Secretary posting. If this does go ahead, both would be in occupation of the highest offices in Sri Lanka's government. Whilst the power struggle continues in the south, military camps are seen to celebrate the return of Rajapaksa. Tamils in the northeast wait anxiously preparing themselves for retribution for their brave calls for justice over the past three years. Many voices have expressed their concerns over the potential backlash minorities may face at the cost of this coup. We have on today Dusi Nandakumar, the former editor-in-chief and current editorial board member of the Tamil Guardian. Hey Dusi, how's it going? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. No, pleasure's Happy off. to be here. <laughs> so tell us more about your journey into journalism and how you started yeah. off with your interest <laughs> in Sri Lankan politics. So it, my interest in Tamil stuff first. I want to know before you got into Tamil Guardian, so uh, what actually spurred your interest? You said it was the um, tsunami, right? Yeah, so the, the tsunami definitely sparked my interest in Tamil stuff in general. So trying Because like, for a lot of us, like myself, yeah. I watched Killing Fields. That's when it first hit me because I, I saw the tsunami as a humanitarian issue, not yeah. as an issue of race or a cultural issue. For me, it never concerned the government. It was more that it was a natural disaster. Whereas for you, it was the humanitarian issue, so the actual tsunami that highlighted the corruption in the government. Yeah, so for me, the tsunami, once the tsunami happened, that kind of sparked my thing about, like like I said, I'm, I'm like a London born and bred. I've never, I've gone back once to Colombo as a child, but I've never been up to the North or East. So it was, a, you know, it was something that wasn't particularly playing a major role in my life if that makes sense mm. and my parents weren't super activists my family weren't you know always into politics and stuff I'd say they were like average Tamil family living in the UK so just trying to get by um, essentially right you know making sure that you can cope with the day to day because living in London as uh, an asylum seeker or refugee family or as a Tamil is hard enough as it mm. is so I don't think I ever really got involved in politics that side so after the tsunami happened and then I saw that actually I wanted to try and do humanitarian stuff, which a lot of Tamils do. Everyone wants to kind of give back. There's lots of charity work going on. We have loads of doctors, and that's one of the reasons I think I became a doctor as well, to be like, oh, you know, I can help people do things or whatever. But then actually when the tsunami happened, I saw actually there was so much politics at play. Like the, the aid just wasn't getting to the north and east. The Tell us more about that. What was the actual issue? So with there was something called the, the PTOMs. Yeah, so there was an agreement between the government and the LTT, the, 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 the Tamil Tigers, that they'd split aid, basically. But essentially the government broke the government agreement, mm. right? And their aid was just not getting to where it was needed. And if you look at the, like the tsunami, the north and the east were hit really, really hard. Probably the hardest, right? Because the tsunami came from... Uh, Indonesia, right? So it was the way the direction it travelled was hitting the east coast first. So the east was really hardly hit and just didn't have the aid going there. So after that, I kind of got involved. Actually, what I actually did for a little while was like Wikipedia edits. <laughs> so I used to get involved in like edit wars or whatever they used yeah. to call them. So I used to start editing these Wikipedia pages because I'd read it and I'd be like, this is 
wrong, right? You read it on Wikipedia, <laughs> like, this is wrong. This is not right. Mm. And then you'd edit it, and then, like, five minutes later, someone, else. Be, someone else has re-edited it. And I was like, what the hell? So I went through, like, I think I spent one summer, basically, on my computer. <laughs> uh, back Do in the days. Do you ever know who would have been the re-editor? Like, does it, so, does it show where they're from? Or uh, no, like it, there was, it was a lot of Sri Lankan flags, basically. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it, says, it says a lot. But that was probably my first kind of venture a wiki into, like, into like politics and stuff because right. it, it forced me, you to read right it forced me to read a lot more about mm. the issue because like, on wikipedia you have to you know, i imagine cite then it, it wouldn't have been stuff. as apparent as it is to us now yeah like, and, 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 and finding all the sources and like finding the right website and in english as well so it, it got forced me into reading and that's what sparked my interest a lot more and then i went to university uh, i was your typical london Tamil medic kind of thing i went to king's um and then the war really started stepping up, right? Okay. So that's when I started, to, when I was in university, my first and second years, when it really ramped up. And I was in my second year when 2009 and stuff happened. And I did not do very well that year. Uh, but I spent a lot of time protesting, getting involved in different campaigns, trying to find the right kind of diaspora organisation, the right group of people that I could kind of band together with. And then I, that's when I found out the Tamil Guardian. I kind of started initially working with them. And then throughout the years, kind of more formally got on board, and um, yeah, now I'm one of the editors and the editorial board. Have you actually been to Sri Lanka as a Tamil Guardian journalist? So, yeah, so the first time I went to Jaffna ever in my life, I've never been to Jaffna before, um, was in 2017, May 2017. Where did you go in Jaffna? Uh, I went everywhere. Uh, that, oh. I went, that was my first thing, and I went as a journalist there. So right. I went to Jaffna, I went to Pumaraviva. Uh, visit in my hometown in Jaffna. We um, I went to May eighteenth was being marked there, which yeah. was like the Tamil Genocide Day. Uh, that was being marked in Mullaivaikal, so I went there and covered it as well. Was, uh, saw the commemorations and things. Was there? Did you face any intimidation from the Sri Lankan authorities? Like, was it very upfront and personal, or yeah, so did they were, kind of maintain a distance between you? I think there've been a couple of times where I've, I've had a few incidents of harassment, basically. Okay. Yeah. Without going into too much kind of detail, they'd come, they'd ask questions, they'd stop you, they'd, you know, at one point there was a copy of my passport taken. Um, but like I said, I'm a British citizen, so I get a little bit more protection. Yeah, exactly. Right? That I speak is... English and this, that and the other, yeah. so I'm a bit more uppity. And, and it's my privilege that I have that I can do that. Whereas if you're a local, you can't. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so much more dangerous for local workers... Uh, than it is for me, basically. But yeah, so I'm lucky for I've, I've got that. Um, I went to uh, November 2017, I went and, and covered Margaret and Arnold there as well, which was a really emotional thing for me because it was my first Margaret and Arnold being marked in the homeland. What was that like? It was intense, really intense, actually, because I went to, uh, in Kinlaunti, there's a place called Kanagapuram. Tell us what actually happens at Margaret and Arnold. Cause... Oh, yeah. Good. Well, traditionally, what used to happen was you go to all the LTT cemeteries, um, there'd be uh, there'd be kind of music, commemorative events. People would light flames, lay flowers on the graves and stuff. Uh, and there were massive graves. There were like twenty seven plus grave sites, cemeteries across the northeast, and there were thousands and thousands of bodies buried there. So the so LTT mass had, graves, yeah, essentially. Well, yeah. yeah, so it was not, like they buried them. So it was very ceremonial. They had okay. tombstones. It was a cemetery, right? Yeah. So it, which is unusual because. You know, in Hindu Saivite kind of tradition, yeah, you burn cremation, bodies, right? Yeah. You, you cremate them. So this was a little bit unusual, but it it made it a lot more sentimental and made it a more personal thing. Where you have these sites where you can pay tribute, essentially. End of the war, or whenever the army kind of took over, they just destroyed all these places. So they literally get their bulldozers, tractors out, tanks, and basically when did run this happen? over. Uh, since the end of the war but it's actually happened a couple of times so every time the army had occupied Jaffna they destroyed all the cemeteries mm. destroyed them completely and this is these are like the graves of have they built over them or was it just like they destroy them just as a power play I guess yeah so I mean there's a few that they built over and they built army camps on top of them okay. right and so you meet um, you know some of these MPs have said they're literally walking with their boots on top of our dead children mm. right so there's a few places they've built over and just and just you know kind of 
trying to make it seem as if it never existed, basically, right? And there are a few that they've just destroyed and just left at, like destroyed pieces. So that was just a statement they wanted yeah, to make. Yeah, probably. So, okay. the, but what's the really powerful bit was the resistance to that. So at Marvel and our last year, people went and for, from the 1st of November onwards, they were gathering all these bits of gravestones, like tiny little fragments that were there or little name packs that were still around. And they built this massive kind of, almost like a monument, yeah. right, to them. It was a really emotional kind of tribute that they made uh, and they had their own ceremony there. So when I went there, like for me, I was, it was really intense because I was like, do I take my shoes off? Well, you know, I'm, you're walking into a grave site. Mm. And if you look at the way that they were before, it was that like meticulously cleaned, every kind of blade of grass was trimmed down. And now it's just like this mass of rubble, rubble and mess. Yeah. And, you know, it looks like a construction site almost, the type of the site of mess it was. But it's such a holy kind of place, right? It's like a temple for a lot of people. So yeah, it was a really emotional experience for me, kind of commemorating it there. And at the same time, I was trying to like do work, if that makes sense, like coverage for Temple Garden. How do the singular population react to such remembrances? They were not happy. <laughs> they really? were not happy. Yeah. When I say the singular population, I don't mean the fundamentally like singular Buddhists. Right. Just the regular people who aren't as vocal. Yeah, as the I mean, it depends. So there is, I think in general, in the South, a lot of people feel quite singular nationalists in okay. general. And they still see the LTT as like terrorists. So it can be really difficult. Mm. Um, but I mean, there are some people who are just like, just let them remember. Okay. And that's quite interesting what you mentioned about LTTE. Do you feel that a lot of people in the South still see Tamils as a threat? A national uh, security threat? Yes and no, in some senses. In, yes, in the sense that, like, yeah, they, they still want army camps in the north and east. And they still raise that issue uh, of Tamils there. And they also raise the issue of the Tamil diaspora, right? It's still a political issue. And, oh, yeah, do, yeah, yeah. Okay. do explain. You know, yeah. <laughs> We're in danger. Yeah, yeah. You guys, well, you guys are seen as extremists. Tamil diaspora is seen as crazy. They're seen as a security threat. You guys can doing all sorts of things. You know, we're doing protests over here. It's it's crazy, and the risk of Tamil separatism, they call it, or terrorism, or whatever, is always there, right? Mm. Um, but at the same time, they know they massacred tens of thousands of, of Tamils. They know they defeated the LTT militarily. So they're always trying to highlight that as well, right? So it's always very difficult. So yeah, I'm actually a doctor at the same time. So I write for Tamil Guardian, and I'm a doctor. Yeah. And how do you manage your time for both? Because you're an editor on board. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very difficult. It's very tough. But, I mean, it's like any, anything you have a passion for, you make time for it, right? You said you got into... Well, you wanted to be a doctor because you saw how the humanitarian crisis actually yeah. affected the Sri Lankans. So, or well, Tamils, I should say. Um, have you or do you wish to actually go to um, afflicted regions and help out with something like, I don't know, Medicine Sans Frontier, so Doctors Without Borders? You know, I think I, initially I had that thought, but now I've kind of seen this political side of things. I don't know if I could, because I think it's quite, it's quite difficult to do that. It's not, sense. it's not long lasting, that impact. Like what yeah. happens is that they often tend to, they help who is needed, but then the long-term implications can only really be done by foreign policy. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, or, no, not not even foreign policy, I guess, grassroots demonstrations within uh, the country itself. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the thing that got me about medicine is I feel like a bit of a small cog in like a big machine, right? As a doctor, if okay. that makes sense, right? Like it's, I'm, I'm a doctor, the NHS is this massive machine and I just work away to see my patient, one patient at a time. Yeah, 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 I guess you all are, but yeah. I'm kind of, I guess I kind of want to break out of the system a little bit and change the system as a whole rather than be a little cog in a machine, which it can be difficult. And I'm not saying, I mean, obviously we need all the cogs, but I don't want to be in that cog, if that makes sense. I just, I think I want to do a little bit more structural changes. But yeah, it's tough. Like I, um, so I'm a GP trainee at the moment, so I'm training to be a GP because I feel like that's what will give me a bit more time to kind of balance my interests a little bit more. Um, but yeah, especially like, so this last last week with the Rajapaksa thing, I was in between patients writing articles <laughs> and getting updates, literally in between patients. But, you know, it's just something you've got when, to do, there's, a, when yeah. there's a coup going on in Sri Lanka, I'm like, my patient Can't wait a couple more minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what was your initial response, your gut response when you heard the announcement? So I first saw the announcement up on social media. I think that's where I first saw it. And initially, my gut reaction was like a sinking feeling in my stomach, to be to be like completely honest. Um, I think just those images of seeing Raj Baksa back in office or, you know, taking up the, these kind of really high level positions was a scary thought just because of all of these things that had happened. I think in 
in the back of my head, thinking about it, we kind of knew that this was a possibility. So we had always known that the Raj Box was gaining momentum in the South. He was getting quite popular mm. and there were talks about elections, but that was for next year. Mm -hmm. So for him to come back so quickly and so suddenly, you know, yeah. it caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, it was, including yeah. yourself? Yeah, including me. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it, was a, it was a bit of a shock announcement to come so quickly. Mm. So yeah, when it first happened, sinking feet in my stomach for sure. Yeah. Definitely. So let's just backtrack a bit. So why does Sri Lanka have both a president and a prime minister? Good question. Uh, it actually started in 1972. So then uh, President J.R.J. J. Wardner created something called the Executive Presidency. Right. And that came about when Sri Lanka had a new constitution put in place. Um, and that he created this office and this is kind of the highest office on the island at the moment. So the Executive Presidency of the Presidency has quite a lot of power. Uh, the Prime Minister kind of heads Parliament. Uh, and that's also quite a powerful position as well. And both kind of work in tandem with each other. Mm. Um, now, recently, over the past few years, what you've had is different people from opposing parties strangely take uh, power as well, of, of presidency and prime ministership. This last three years, you've seen Maidri Pala Sirisena as president from the SLFP, mm. but he was in coalition with Rana Wickremesinghe of the UMP. Right. However, over recent months and recent weeks, and as you can see more sharply in recent days, their, their relationship has really deteriorated. It's been, you know, an open secret that it's been going downhill, uh, which is why Raj Box's return was seen as something imminent, but not this quick. Do you know, that's quite interesting because, if I'm right to believe, Sirisena has only 95 MPs or 85 MPs on his side, whereas Wickram Singer has 105. So how does that work? Because... I mean, one would assume that the president would have more um, MPs on his side. Yeah, so it's inter what's happened now is Syria Sen has joined up with Rajapaksa. So they've made an alliance, essentially, within, within the SLFP and they're opposing the UMP of, of Ranil mm. Wickremesinghe. So um, what you're seeing now, essentially, is a battle for those MPs. Right. So you've got some parties like the TNA and the JVP, which is the leftist Sinhalese Nationalist Party as well, say that they're going to abstain and the TNA initially said they were going to abstain, but now they've come out in support of Rano this mm. morning, actually. Right. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is over these last few weeks that it's a battle for MPs. So uh, Rajabaksa has been appointed as Prime Minister. You've got this strange situation where Rano posted on his social media saying, I'm still the Prime Minister, uh, mm. like a big banner <laughs> out there, which is the weirdest thing for a Prime Minister to have exactly. to post, mm. right, to say, I'm still the Prime Minister. And they're both basically batting for control of Parliament. So they've, it's kind of gotten to this stage where they've reached an agreement that actually the way we settle this is by seeing who's got the most MPs in Parliament. Right. Right. So Suri Sena has now gone off and said Parliament will reconvene at whatever date. We don't know yet. Right. And when it reconvenes, whoever has the most number of prime minister, uh, most number of parliamentarians, will be the prime minister. So how much power does the prime minister have? You say he's in charge of the parliament, but in terms of laws and bills being passed. What is the Prime Minister's role? Yeah, so the Prime Minister, to be honest, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky situation because the presidency is the more powerful office. So the president is the one who kind of appoints yeah. cabinets. The Prime Minister still has a really important role, though. So they still have a few portfolios under them. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, exactly to the extent of the powers that they have. But even symbolically, it's quite a strong position to be in. And the Prime Minister heads parliaments. So you need to have that confidence and you can still, you know, um, you have a very kind of leading role in these, in what, how the laws are passed and stuff. Right. So earlier this year, there were the Kandy riots, the yeah. racist violence against Muslims in Kandy. Mm -hmm. The criminals responsible for that have now been released upon the appointment of Rajapaksa. Yeah. Is this just an example of the powers that Rajapaksa will have as prime minister? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So... There was an idea about whether that was timed for the Raj Baksa things. We don't know if that was going to happen anyway. Uh, but it is, I mean, Raj Baksa's appointment and the fact that th these candy guys got greeted with like malas and mm, stuff when they went mm, back to candy. A celebration, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a party when they came back. And that kind of stuff is, it's a scary omen of, of things Definitely. to come, I think. Right. So I think it gives you an idea of the kind of environment that's going on in, in the South, at least at the moment, and on the island as a whole. Right. So some believe that Rajapaksa's appointment is actually a result of the current economic downturn in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you believe this is true? Yeah, so there's definitely a, a massive economic element to it. So Rajapaksa, as soon as he sees control of these ministries, the first thing he does is he takes the finance thing for himself, the mm -hmm. finance portfolio, um, and then he starts releasing all these subsidies for farmers. 
releases like fertilizer subsidies, gives all these concessions, basically cancelling loans, all sorts of stuff to help the farmers out because that's where their rural base is, right? That's where the most the chunk of his support is. So it's not just that, but he also there's also been this idea that over the last few years uh, the country's gone a little bit soft. Ronald's been in charge. He's very west leaning. They're leaning towards the west a lot more. The economic crisis has been bad. There's been you know the central bank bond scam which you know, Ronald's accused of being involved in or having associates involved in, lots of corruption issues as well. And also the other fact that I think plays a role is the fact that Ronald was the guy who signed this UN resolution exactly. right, in Geneva, yeah. right? And I think that definitely plays a role there because they see Ronald as this weaker guy compared to Rajapaksa, who is... He compares himself to an ancient singular king, right? So there's a king called Dutan Gemalu who uh, defeated a Tamil king called El Lalan, and he compares himself to that king, right? The ancient singular king who defeated an ancient Tamil king. Um, so there's all of that. Ronald was the guy instead who signed a ceasefire. Is that fact or mythology? That's mythology. I, right. I think there was, there, I think there was a, a, an actual singular king and Tamil king right. who fought back in the days. I don't know... To what extent but the story the stems yeah. from that. Yeah, okay. but that's why, I mean, he compares himself to the same thing because he beat Prabhakaran, so he says, right? So right. that's so he that mythology, he really plays that off That comparison of. is yeah. and fascinating. So both Ronald, like I said, signed the ceasefire, went into peace talks with the LTT. They see Ronald as the weaker guy. So you reckon the recent 39th session with the Human Rights Council had a bit of a sway amongst the public in Sri Lanka? I think so. I think this is why you've had Siri Sena had to come out so strongly and say, you know what, there will not be any war crimes prosecutions there won't be any international mm. judges because he has to keep up this pretense that yes you know even though we're doing this we're doing this to win back the international community but we're not going to prosecute anyone and i yeah, suppose appointing rajapaks of the man who actually orchestrated it yeah is... it's a power move it's a big yeah. power move for him and rajapaks to be fair like he's got that support right so the mm. first thing that rajapaks does well, one of the first things he does he meets with the head of the army the head of the navy the head of the air force he meets the chief of defense staff he gets an Air Force helicopter to go all the way to Kandy, where he meets the Buddhist monks at the Temple of the Tooth. Mm. Now, that's another tradition that Sri Lankan Sinhalese leaders do. When you take up office, you go to the Temple of the Tooth, you meet the monks, and they basically appoint you as the king, <laughs> right? So you get their blessings. So Sinhala Buddhism is very much ingrained into our constitution. Of course. Yeah, yeah, it's ingrained into the island as a whole. Mm. If you want to go into those upper chambers of power and, and, and get into those the top of the structures, it, it's Sinhala Buddhism that you have to play to. Mm. So, in the 2015 elections, Sirisena actually abandoned Rajapaksa's campaign, right? Yeah. So then, why has he actually made this U-turn? Like, what does he yeah. gain from it? It, it doesn't quite make a, sense yeah, to me. That's a good question. I, and <laughs> to be honest, there's, you know, you have to go inside the mind of Sirisena to understand mm. this. But I think it's to do with political survival, to be honest, right? Like mm. I said, he was... They got swamped in these local elections. So earlier this year, there were local elections. Rajapaksa started his own party, the SLPP party, mm -hmm. and took on both Syriza and Renal, and he swept the South, absolutely swept the South. Like, the South voted en masse uh, for Rajapaksa. If you look at the Northeast, it's always a bit of a different story because the Tamils are there and, and, the, and the Muslims and others. Um, but in the South, they all vote for him. And I think, again, he saw this as a sign of the way things were going, and this is political survival for him. He just needs to jump onto something that's a good thing for him. And Ronald was a sinking ship. Yeah. So on the 30th of October, we saw the protest of tens of thousands of people in Klamo. And although it was mostly Wickremesinger and the UNP supporters who took centre stage, the protest was also attended by many calling to reconvene Parliament and to restore de democracy. And many were claiming that they asked Mandela, but got Mugabe. But you tweeted saying this is nothing new. Why is yeah. that? So for me, the way I see it, and I think the way a lot of them will see it, is this struggle to become president or prime minister or take up these senior roles, it's seen as a struggle in Colombo, right? A lot of the Tamils, I mean, obviously they're fearful of a Rajapaksa return, but I think they've also have the sense that this is just a Colombo battle. It's not our fight, right? Because mm -hmm. whoever's in office, they both done egregious things they don't right? have the best interests yeah, for Tamils at heart exactly right start, yeah. so and if you look through the history of Sri Lanka whoever has been president or prime minister from the Jaya Warners to the Premadasas to Chandrika all of like successive Sri Lankan leaders have all conducted wars against Tamils mm. right or conducted massive human rights abuses even serious said a militarization um, you know singularization of, of Tamil areas 
Uh, all of these, like, it's basically just been a continuation of that system. So for me, the way I see it and the way I think a lot of people see it, it doesn't matter who sits at the top of the system. It's the system as a whole that needs changing. So TNA is never really, does TNA ever rep- represent the Tamils? Uh, the TNA is its own different question. So the TNA is the Tamil National Alliance. Right. The TNA was actually started, you know, around the time of the LTT. Right, it was the it was seen as the political representatives of Tamil nationalism. Right in Parliament, it was a coalition of parties who basically said we back the LTT. We believe the LTT is our representatives at the time, and the idea was they would do the political thing. The LTT was waging a war. Right, so it was kind of they both worked in tandem and, and, and together. And during the war, uh, you know, they they would back Tamil nationalist policies. You know, during the war, the leader of the TNA, Sunderman, was outside the UN offices with a big sign saying, stop this genocide, Mm. right? Saying what was happening is a genocide and protesting against the war. Post-LTT kind of era, post-end of the armed conflict, the TNA has taken a really trickier line. And I think what you've seen is they've adopted this dual strategy where in the Northeast, in Tamil, in their local language, they will adopt really hardline Tamil nationalist stances, right? Mm. Because that's what they know will win votes. So they'll put Prabhupada's photo on the front page of their electoral leaflets. They will give really strong, stirring speeches about federalism, about how much we have sacrificed or how much we have given and this and that. But in Colombo, when they speak in English, when they speak in Singular, when they speak to the Western diplomats, they adopt a very, you know, passive, uh, soft kind of stance. So even in Parliament, they wouldn't... No, exactly. And that's, this Represent what, the Tamils, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so this is the problem. And I think, you know, some of them has been noted to, you know, tell foreign diplomats that actually, you know, we need bicycles rather than, you know, pushing for other human rights mm. accountability or justice mechanisms and things. And there was a big scare and a fear amongst the Tamils in the Northeast that there would be this, the TNA may drop accountability. Oh, and they haven't been able to get anything tangible from it so far, right? It's right. been 10 years since the end of the war. Yeah, all. exactly. What, what's happened? Nothing's really happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the then TNA. what's the TNA's take on the coup and the recent events? That's so the TNA have actually, this morning, like I said, uh, they were abstaining a little bit from it. TNA, it was, you know, I think a lot of Tamils were a bit annoyed because the leader of the TNA met with Rajapaksa the exactly. other day, which was seen as like, you know, you're going and meeting the guy who orchestrated I mean, this genocide. Some even assume that that means that he's been bought off by Rajapaksa. Yeah. Is that true? Um, I don't think he has been because what's happened now is you've seen them this morning, they've come out and released a statement against Rajapaksa, basically, so mm. in support of Ronald. So I don't know if they've been bought off by him. There has been one TNA MP yeah, who's, yeah, switched, yeah. Yeah, who's switched across uh, to, uh, to Rajapaksa's side. But then, you know, there were reports that the Rajapaksas were offering bribes of up to $2 million or more $2 million US to come over to their side. Big money. Uh, and then, I'm, as I'm sure it's been the other way as well, I'm sure Western diplomats and Western governments who have been staunch in their support of Runnell have also been offering things. They may not say it right. overtly. It may mm. not be bribes, but it could be stuff like visas, scholarships for your kids, lots of different ways. And I'm sure there's a lot of horse trading going both ways. You know, they say China was backing right. the way. I think the West is probably going the other way. But like you said, um, the Bataclan MP that defected to Rajapaksa's side. Do you think many of the TNA MPs will actually follow in his suit? Or is it hard to say right now, even if they've um, come out in support of Ronald? Yeah, I think it's difficult to say right now. I think within the TNA, so the TNA is actually a coalition. There's lots of different parties part Mm. of the TNA. So this guy who defected was part of PLOT. Um, Within the TNA, there's always a little bit of tension between the constituent parties as well. So it's difficult to say what's coming up in the next few weeks. I mean, even within the SFP and the UMP, the two big Mm -hmm. similar parties. So yeah, I think we're going to have to wait and see what the next few days brings. Wait and see what the, you know, when the dust settles, what happens, basically. So Tamil Guardian's very own journalist, Uliya yeah. Rasashalan, he was actually interrogated recently by the Sri Lankan authorities. And the interrogators actually said that had it been two years ago, they would have hung him upside down and made him disappear. These are their exact words. Yeah. So given this, what does the future look like for journalists and Tamils at the hands of the renewed Singular Buddhist state? So we are really, really concerned about our correspondence for the Tamil Guardian, and also we're worried about journalists in general. So for, for Charlene, who is um, a really, really good journalist, uh, he was interrogated for all sorts of stuff. Um, nothing to do with like his, his work, essentially, and he was you know interrogated really scarily. Luckily, Charlene, because he was quite well-renowned, he's got an Instagram following, he's got a Twitter following, he was kind of, had an air of protection. Oh, I he see. has a bit of an international persona mm-hmm. about him, right? But there are loads of other uh, journalists out there who don't have that same international presence. Yeah, I hear many are actually having to delete their accounts and go on to burner phones now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. True? Exactly. Essentially, that's exactly what's happened. So we've had 
Uh, some of our guys had to delete their like social media posts. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been getting in contact with, with our journalists to basically be like, hey guys, don't worry, like things will be okay. We're trying to reassure them. We're, we're alerting embassies. We're speaking to international human rights groups and say, look, something has to happen. But it's a scary time in the Northeast for sure. There's a lot of security concerns. But like I said, I really don't know whether <laughs> what's going to happen because if Rajapaksa government may not even mean that. Right, but it's not just journalists. We have the mothers of Sri Lanka's disappeared. Mm. They're campaigning on A9 Road in Kilnochi. Now, even them, they're at danger, right? Because of um, Rajapaksa's appointment. Will they still have those safe spaces to campaign and advocate for such for their rights, yeah, for their sons? And, and honestly, they're, they're concerned. I mean, there was a little bit... <laughs> They're frustrated at Runnell. Runnell was the guy who came last year or the year before. He didn't come, sorry. In an interview, he said, you know, the missing or the disappeared. Yeah, it's a really terrible, tragic case. But, you know, they're most probably all dead, right? And to the mothers, that was heartbreaking. You just can't say that. You just that. don't say that, yeah. yeah you don't, you don't yeah. say that. You don't, you don't say that without actually giving them an explanation as to what That's happened. That's cold, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. You, you can't just say that. These people have been, for decades, some of them, searching for their yeah. kids. For their kids. And it's heartbreaking. So... For them, Rana was also like a horrible person, horrible guy, horrible person that has not been giving them answers to any of their questions. But for sure, the security concerns are there. With Rajapak, the Rajapak is the guy who did a lot of these mm. things directly, right? Directly led the military campaign, basically. And a lot of people surrendered their kids in the last stages of the war, right? A lot of people told their kids to go and surrender, right? Because they, they thought they'd be actually... safe. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a really, you know, you're stuck in a hard place, in a hard choice. But I think you'll see this kind of tightening of the noose. You'll see this bit of a clamp. You say that, but I feel like with the international community, so um, paying literally no attention, dehumanising the Tamils to this extent, I feel like that gives them the leeway to do such things, mm. to continue that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is the thing. We, we need the international community to take... Uh, the safety and protection of the Tamils in the Northeast really seriously. We've been pushing for like international organizations and UN officials and Western diplomats to go and visit the Northeast, but right? Go haven't. there. But they haven't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. so it, it, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, related to the safe spaces, as we all know, Mavi Ranar, so Martyrs Remembrance Day, is soon approaching. And that's been going on for two years now. They've been able to come out and into safe spaces and actually mourn and the suffering of their loss. And so do you think they will still be able to do that now that Rajapaksa could be Prime Minister? Yeah, or... good question. Um, so it's still a scary time. It's still a scary time. I mean, even the people that are coming out for Marvinal, it's, it's, uh, they're coming out despite the security risk because there's still a security risk there. It's not like it's been completely... So they're actually forced. fighting that. Yeah, because right. a lot of people had to fight and they still had to do... A lot of people still did things in secret because, it, you know, it's only in the last couple of years, like you said, yeah. that you can come out mm. a bit more openly. But it's still not completely safe. It's still not safe. completely risk-free because, as you can see, the organisers from last year are now being questioned again, mm. right, by the TID. Mm. So even if you come out and open, they will still make a note, right? I actually had this... Uh, conversation with one of our one of the journalists on the ground um, last year and we were talking about this relative period of freedom that we've had over the last couple of years under this government and he told me it reminded him of the ceasefire period mm -hmm. so during the ceasefire period again there was a little bit more freedom to do certain things they could write a bit more they could speak out a bit more and the military at the time in these military occupied areas like Jaffna Jaffna was still under military occupation the military would tell these journalists apparently you know our hands are tied, but our eyes are opened, which means we're watching you, right? And when the ceasefire then broke down, what you found is those journalists and activists were the ones who were being assassinated, kidnapped, abducted again, right? So for a lot of the Tamil people now, this ceasefire period that we've had over the last three years is beginning to break down again. So oh, even over the last couple of years, why would you want to, you know, stick your head out and get your name marked, right? All right. So... Yeah, so I, I think there is that fear that even stuff like Marvel and none, there's going to be those security risks and stuff again. And I think especially with the return of the Rajapaksas, you know, people might not come out on the scale that they have done in previous years. So they're still going to go ahead and... I think even under the Rajapaksas, mm -hmm. there were people who would do stuff in secret. Wow. If they, if, you know, if they had to, they will do it in secret, do it in their homes. I mean, the Rajapaksas were, you know, really brutal. They, mm. like, you know took bells out of temples, said you can't light flames, really, really crazy stuff, right? Jaffna University in 2012, I think it was, you have to check, but was stormed by the police because there was reports of students lighting candles, 
like literally lighting candles could get the police into your into your rooms right yeah so that's how crazy it was so um is there is this the end for any hope of reconciliation that was promised in 2015 hmm <laughs> that's a tricky one this is this is bearing in mind this is if if Rajapaksa actually does get yeah. appointed as I Prime mean, Minister. The thing is, I, th- I think our hopes for a reconciliation don't lie in Colombo. It doesn't lie in the Sri Lankan state. I don't think... What do you but, mean by that? I mean, I don't see... Where else would... Yeah. So, yeah, this is, that's what it is. So, I don't think it's going to be Sri Lanka on its own accord giving us reconciliation or giving us accountability and truth and justice. So it's going to have to have more intervention. I think it's going to have to be international pressure that drives Sri Lanka to do this. Otherwise, you leave Sri Lanka to do it on its own and it will do what it's been doing for the last 30 odd years Mm. and it will just carry on committing genocide. They see, I mean, Sri Lanka is seen as a singular Buddhist island, right? And they see the whole island as singular Buddhist. Tamils are invaders. Tamils, they say, are, are, are Indians, are South Indians, right? So... Uh, for them, I mean, the island should be singular Buddhists, <laughs> which is why you've got all these big Buddhist viharas popping mm-hmm. up everywhere, right? Which is why you've got lots of singularization happening. Like in Jaffna, there's massive viharas now. Yeah. In the east, there's really big ones. Because they see it as a singular Buddhist country, a singular Buddhist island. So the hopes of reconciliation, my hopes, are in kind of international pressure rather than something coming from Colombo or in the south. Okay. And lastly, the presidential election, that's next year. Uh, inevitably, Rajapaksa will be running for election, as many have premeditated. What do you reckon his chances are? Yeah, scarily good. Scarily good <laughs> chances. Look at the local elections. He wiped the floor with the opposition in the local elections. He really took control of the South. And the way it's structured in Sri Lanka, if you control the Sinhalese majority in the South, you, you, you know, you're going to be at the top, uh, at the top of the pedestal. And I think Rajapaksa, he knew he had good chances. And he knows he's got a lot of popular support. So, it's, yeah, scary times for us. Scary times indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Lucien, for coming on our show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Really enjoyed having this conversation. It was nice to get to talk at this really interesting time. So we'll see what happens. As the deadline for Rajapaksa to prove his claim to the office of Prime Minister nears, we're seeing a majority of 118 MPs signing a resolution refuting Sirisena's actions and calling on Parliament to be immediately reconvened. However, given Sri Lanka's long tradition of fluid party allegiances, who's to say what might happen? Thank you guys for listening. Check out 47 Roots' documentary, Sri Lanka's Disappeared, and please don't forget to follow us on Insta. This is Myra, signing out.